All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of The Green Room. Uh, I'm Brandon Middleton, uh, super excited to have a special guest uh, who will introduce herself in just a second. But if you're rocking with us for the very first time, uh, The Green Room is a supplement to a course that we just taught at Stanford University called um, Designing Black and Brown Spaces. And this was a course where we tried to create space for black and brown geniuses to talk about uh, how they've chartered their course uh, in terms of their careers, uh, what community and what college have meant to them uh, as they move throughout the world and made, uh, made their different moves. So uh, if you're new here, uh, hopefully you'll find this uh, enlightening, uh, funny. It could, it could take on a whole lot of different things, but uh, at the end of the day, we're hoping that you have something to put in your back pocket so that uh, you slip in less potholes and uh, you, know, you can uh, see straight to where you're trying to get to um, and, and benefit from the things that we've learned. So uh, without further ado, I wanna introduce our special guest, uh, Heather Dowdy, who has uh, been a friend for a long, long time and is doing some really cool things. Um, Heather, take just a couple minutes to, to introduce yourself to the people, uh, wh where are you at? You know, what are you up to these days? And then after that, we'll jump into some conversation. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Brandon, and good to see you. It's been a minute, but I'm glad to be talking to you all today. Um, currently, I uh, lead partner strategy for the Microsoft AI for Accessibility Grant Program, and that essentially means I get to work with really cool people, um, entrepreneurs, researchers, nonprofits, anybody that wants to use AI to empower people with disabilities. Um, I come to this work honest. <laughs> a lot of people are like, okay, so do you have a disability? Like, what's your story? And the truth is, I was born into this. I tell people all the time, I was born to be an ally for people with disabilities. Both of my parents are deaf and hard of hearing. And so growing up, sign language was a part of the way that we communicated. Technology was all around us. I mean, I learned sign language at six months old. Hmm. So I'm a CODA, which is child of deaf adults. And, and there's a whole community um, of people who have similar experiences to me. But what was so unique, I think, is the fact that we were dealing with both race and disability. Hmm. Um, growing up on the South side of Chicago, I proudly represent the South side of Chicago, no matter where I am, uh, even though I've relocated now to work at Microsoft. But in growing up in that type of environment, I was immediately put into the position of being an ally and an advocate at times for my parents and for people that look like my parents even now. Um, and so I, like I said, grew up with all of this tech around me and I just knew that I wanted to be an inventor. Like I wanted to make the gadgets that we use and these gadgets help my father um, and my mother, you know, be able to communicate with people. There was like the TTY, which is this big bulky teletype writing device that they could type on one line at a time um, to some, to a relay service to be able to talk to you and I on the phone. Mm. There were other gadgets that were connected to the doorbell when someone came and rang the doorbell and that it was connected um, to a lamp and the doorbell to let my parents know that someone was at the door. Mm -hmm. So really basic things, but they provided independence and access in a way that is just truly fundamental. And so um, growing up, you know, I was like, okay, that, that's what I wanna do. And went to school and got my engineering degree and have been on this really cool trajectory where I've always been in tech. So I've been in tech coming up on 15 years, started out in mobile devices, uh, but focused on accessibility and, and particularly how mobile devices can empower and help people with disabilities, all types of disabilities, uh, whether you are blind or have low vision, whether you use a wheelchair, uh, whatever your accessibility need is, there is truly a way to be innovative in meeting that need because you, you find that um, people are on a spectrum and no dis disability is alike. And we like to say that it's the one group that you can join in at any point in your lifetime. So while you might not need that 
assistance or that accommodation today, you might need it in the future. And so being able to grapple with those types of questions on how to really make something usable is something that I have always enjoyed. And so I've done that in uh, the mobile devices space and, and came over to Microsoft in the Seattle area mm -hmm. to do accessibility in the web space. And now I'm in AI. That's amazing. Like there's so much, um, just as a nation, like learning that I think we as adults need to be able to do to be more empathetic um, for each other. But then as we are the parents of another generation who are like born with technology, there's another layer of stuff that we're going to have to articulate to them. And then when you throw AI into this, um, you know, a lot of people think that it's like the, the, uh, the fix all, but like, AI is created, the algorithms are created by people who have bias and have yes. you know, human tendencies. So there's a bunch of uh, just work that needs to be done. And it's cool to be able to be at the intersection of all of these things. But at the same time, they could probably be uh, heavy. And there's like, not just the tech industry that has to contribute to it, but like the legislation and the government side, the civic and like the people side of how it's actually um, harmonized in order to make life better as opposed to worse for all of us. Um, so that's, that's cool to know that you're, um, that you're putting your boots on every single day and walking yes. in to make it better. Um, yeah. So like maybe the first question that I'll ask is about um, kind of this sense of community. You know, we're both kind of black and brown people, but then when you, you know, add an inter intersectionality point of the deaf and hard of hearing community, um, the course name for the Stanford class this past quarter was Community College. Um, just focusing on the community part of it, what are some things that, you know, if you didn't have this particular experience with the deaf and hard of hearing community, uh, what's unique? What kind of insights or what kind of things have you been able to appreciate about that particular community as you've uh, kind of came up in the world? Oh, that's such a, a big question and such a, a good one as well, um, because when we think about uh, the deaf community and deafness, um, there's actually a way that is talked about it within the community that is very nuanced in the sense that you can be deaf with a lowercase d to mean mm -hmm. that, hey, you just have a medical condition versus capital D in deaf means that you are part of the deaf community. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you share the language and you know, you're know you around the people. And so it is very much an identity um, to be part of the deaf community. And so it uh, it's with me everywhere I go. And what's even um, stronger in my mind is that I grew up without even knowing it in a very strong Black deaf community in Chicago, with it being uh, such a major city and um, it has a good group of, of Black deaf people that knew that they had to come together and yeah. kind of bring resources together. And it's like the one place that you go to learn about a lot of different things. Uh, these community type of organizations. And so it, it is very important uh, for me to identify as being part of uh, this community, although I don't have a disability because of being around it, the ins and outs and how much it is part of their identity. I have such an appreciation for community and what community can mean um, for our mental and social well-being. Yeah. That's, I have a, a, a uncle who was, was deaf and he was my father's youngest brother. And uh, I remember uh, going to his graduation from college. He went to, uh, to Gallaudet on the East Coast and he went to RIT for a little, like there are these spots that lots of people in these, these communities like form around. And I had never had the like the pleasure to see him in his element with his community. It was always, let's just go to Uncle Stephen's house. He lived downstairs from grandma. And it was just me and him, you know, playing PlayStation games together, but never me and him and his community. And the first time that I saw him, <laughs> like with his community, like just come alive and all the light bulbs and the expressiveness that people use, like they use the whole body to communicate. Yeah. It's the hands, but it's the face, it's the, 
is everything. And that was such a, a cool thing for me to see and observe as a young person and to know that there are all these pockets of disability and these groups that if you don't have one that you can go through life not really seeing, not really appreciating and not really knowing how to uh, interact with. And when there's that fear, then you usually just close up and kind of move aside. But I think the opportunity, once you know something about it, to actually be vulnerable and comfortable and to have those uh, formative experiences, which can grow into like this healthy respect, this healthy um, kind of back and forth dialogue. That's that's what what we need. <laughs> and uh, it's true. I mean, we have deaf picnics. I mean, it, it. There are so many things like the deaf communities within churches. It's like a, a real community, and it it's a deep thing. And I love that you were able to see it firsthand. I wish most people did because I wouldn't have gotten some of the silly questions I got growing up was like, oh, your house must be really quiet or, you know, all of these other things. But when you get around this community, you see like they like to talk more <laughs> than other communities. It's very expressive. Our whole body is part of the language. You know, there's even black ASL that's got swag and, and sauce on it. And so there are all of these types of things that that just open up your worldview so much when you actually take the time to get to, to know people um, more than what you can or cannot see. Yeah, so we, when you intersect kind of the community with the technology, um, you talked a little bit about TTY and kind of the, the lights on and off connected to the doorbell. Um, if we fast forward to like what's happening in your world like right now or what are some of the major challenges um, or hurdles that we can get through in this generation for um, kind of a, a more equal playing field for everybody? What are a couple of things that uh, come to mind? Oh, that's a good question. But I love the fact that I'm in AI right now because I get to talk about the future. Mm -hmm. I get to talk about what could be. And more importantly, I think I get to turn a lot more people into champions for inclusion, true inclusion. Um, because I also believe that, you know, you can be a diverse and not inclusive. So uh, what is it when you do have people at the table? What does it mean to really include them? Um, and so it's such, it's so many fascinating things that we're thinking about with, with AI. Um, but AI runs on lots and lots of data, period. Mm -hmm. Um, that's how our voice assistants are able to recognize our voices so well without having to train them as much anymore. But yet, in, when it comes to just lighting up and enabling new scenarios and innovations for the disability community, we're not as far as we could be because there is a lack of data. We call it a, a data desert. And that's just because I like to tell people that you know anybody can take a, a picture of like a plant outside for instance and you can get millions and millions of those uh, pictures in order to train your machine learning model to recognize a new picture of a plant however it takes more time uh, to sit down and perhaps collect data voice data for a person with cerebral palsy for instance yeah. um, and so those hours of recording uh, are are things that are necessary in order to make voice assistance, for example, uh, inclusive of people who have impacted speech. And so data collection um, in a responsible way is really at the forefront of our mind right now in AI, because it's going to take collecting a lot of data with um, the community. And we need that community to collect data as well. Uh, because it's no stranger to us as Black people that there's a mistrust sometimes of technology. Um, and so the disability community has that too. And so it's it's very much a concern about privacy and insecurity when you talk about collecting data. Because sometimes you could trace back to that person's unique voice um, because they have impacted speech. And so thinking about these types of problems that uh, can be a, a challenge to solve just means that you have to also be inclusive in your approach. And that's why we say things like, although you know AI is new and emerging, the idea of innovation is the same. You should not 
have anything without the people that you're trying to serve. And so there's a phrase in the disability community, nothing about us without us. Um, so that just means that we need more and more people with disabilities themselves at the table making this technology. And that truly is one of my passions, which is educating uh, more people with disabilities to enter the STEM field because there are um, barriers and challenges that have been there for quite some time. And I just truly believe that AI could be that disruptor. Yeah, that's that's so good to hear. And I'm thinking about like just a couple of events uh, when I first started this job uh, that I currently have. The first like um, one to many type of event that we had to do was via COVID. And since we couldn't be in person and have that interaction, uh, the planning committee was uh, wondering like what it would take in order for us to uh, have a sign language kind of person piped in to be able to translate what we're talking about uh, to extend the accessibility to like as broad uh, a range of people as possible. And it's been interesting to see, you know, if you go on YouTube, you get the closed caption so that um, people aren't taking for granted as much that they're just going to be folks without disabilities um, interacting with the content. So I've been pleased with the progress. I feel like it's been incremental and maybe not as fast as what we would have wanted. But uh, I do see small things here and there that give me hope and make me smile. Um, maybe a question though is about uh, what, what are you like teaching the younger generation uh, or what would you like um, as being in tech for 15 years say to the person who may be just starting this walk in terms of what they need to keep in their back pocket or what they need to consider in order to um, be as diverse, be as inclusive, be as friendly uh, to accessibility, um, uh, to the cause of accessibility as they can? Yeah, that that's a, a really good question. And like I said, because I'm passionate about educating the next generation of uh, leaders who just happen to have disabilities, mm -hmm. um, I think about that a lot. And I think about how to really build a pipeline um, to success. And um, that's truly because representation matters, you know? So for instance, you're talking about the captioning, uh, which is great that um, we have more and more uh, AI produced captions, which is able to increase some of the accuracy, but in some places it's still lacking. And so to know the context in terms of you know, is this really usable? You gotta have people with disabilities at the table once again. Um, because I know for me in this COVID era where folks are at home, I really had a hard time one day. I was trying to share a, a sermon clip from YouTube uh, with my parents. And so I clicked that button and I looked at it and it was just messing up in some really crucial places that would be really frustrating. Um, so, I say all that to say that uh, I, I do start with that principle of, you know, making sure that we as a whole and particularly the next generation um, that perhaps doesn't have a disability, that they immerse themselves in the experience and get to know people uh, with disabilities in order to really understand what the pain points and challenges are. Um, and I also, I teach, a lot of basics. So I was very fortunate to be able to start a, a STEM camp at Microsoft for high school students with disabilities called Ninja Camp mm -hmm. um, a couple years ago. And we were able uh, to really teach uh, some technical training. But I also like to say we did some le leadership skills, those, those soft skills too, because you know, at the core, whether you're black and brown or black and brown with a disability, you have to have some sense of confidence in who you are that you bring to the table. Because many times in this particular work, you might have a dissenting voice and opinion to say, hey, yep, we do have captions, but you know what? We can do better. And so having that confidence in, in yourself and knowing what your strengths are and what you bring to the table, I think are just very fundamental uh, for our, our youth in, in the next generation, as well as that empathy 
building muscle of truly being around other people whose perspectives are different than ours. Uh, for black and brown people, we have no choice. <laughs> Our yeah. networks are, are statistically more diverse because they have to be, but that isn't necessarily the case for people that aren't from marginalized communities. And that really is a place that I start. Yeah, that's, uh, for people who are watching this, like I'm hoping that everybody's grabbing it and putting it in their back pockets and uh, will take away a whole lot um, one of the things that I'd love for you to paint a picture on has to do with the actual like employment, economic experience and opportunity for like if you were, you know, your parents 40 years ago or like whenever they're seeking a job out, you know, I know how I traditionally, you know, would apply for something and have a phone call, a phone screen and how I get on, on video and like do an interview, but walk us through um one, I saw a statistic that, you know, quite a number more, you know, from a percentage perspective of people who um, have disabilities are unemployed. And yeah. then you layer COVID and the pandemic on top of it. And then I want you to paint a picture of like, what does it actually take um, to actually succeed in the interview, to onboard, to actually do a job uh, when you've got, you know, an extra a um, couple of considerations in order to get to what productivity might look like for a corporation or organization. Yeah, I love that you framed it that way because I don't know that I really share it with people. I assume that they're able to, to see it, but truly that is what my passion and, and my drive is and my extra fight is, is because I'm trying to make that journey to employment and that journey to independence a lot easier than what it was for my parents. Yeah. Very fortunate. Um, that they were able to get really stable jobs, uh, one of which was with the government and they have laws on hiring people. And so that was really uh, good back in the day. And, and there um, is a, a whole host of people with disabilities in some of these pockets of government agencies. But it, then I just was like, but is that it? Like, I just really feel like people with disabilities should have choice and employment just like we do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so the fact that I was able to choose to be an engineer and be able to complete that path, I don't take that lightly. Of course, I have my own barriers being a black woman <laughs> and you and I know those personally because we were side by side doing some of that homework. Uh, but I, I just, you know, think to myself, those were my barriers. But then I can't even imagine if you had to add disability on top of that yeah. um, in this day and age. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like that, it can't be. So that's that's why I get up every day um, until we change that narrative because you're exactly right. The unemployment rate for people with disabilities is twice that than a person without disabilities. Mm -hmm. And that was before COVID. And for some disability segments, it was 80%. Mm -hmm. um, during COVID, more than a million people with disabilities lost their jobs. And, and you know more counting. And so when we think about uh, what it's going to take to recover from COVID as a global economy, uh, that could put a lot of people with disabilities even further back, yeah. you know? Um, and so that narrative, that statistic has to change. It has been that way, that high for 30 years, wow. for 30 years since they started counting, which is when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. Um, and I can get into that, but just go watch the Netflix, uh, Crip, Netflix video, Crip Camp, uh, that was produced by the Obamas, very informative. But 30 years of that, really? I'm like, okay, like AI, opportunity, like let's disrupt that narrative. Um, and so when I think about some of the opportunities that we're looking at, uh, particularly there are researchers at Vanderbilt University that are looking at, um, they're developing a virtual job coach for people with autism, living with autism. And this virtual job coach will actually, you know, measure your eye gaze, your stress levels during a job interview. And given if those levels are too high or if something changes, the job, the interviewer actually adjusts the interview. 
um, mm -hmm. and perhaps ask questions at, at a different pace or, or different things. And so what's really cool about that is we're not asking the person with a disability to change. We're changing our process, the environment. That's what that particular research is, is proving out. And so why that is important is because fundamentally, you know, the World Health Organization looks at disability or defines it as a mismatch between a person and their environment, hmm. not their ability, <laughs> not yeah. they can't do something. The environment is not set up for success. And yeah. so if we really think like that, if we really have that inclusive mindset, it becomes what can we do collectively to remove barriers for everyone to provide equity, again, that we're very familiar with in the black and brown community, which is why I'm very fortunate to kind of sit at this intersection because I get to go, well, I see how it's done over here for black and brown folks. I see the parallels for disability, but nobody is connecting the dots between the two, which, um, you know, we could talk a little bit more later, but, but that, project is an example. There are also other ways in which AI, um, I'm hopeful, could maybe start to reduce some of the bias in the interviewing process. Uh, so if I am not going to be able to talk with you over the phone, do I have other modes of communication with you? You know, um, do I have to disclose my disability right away? Or, you know, can we make that process easy if I need to request an interpreter? There are so many different things that technology can do to sort of close that gap uh, for sure. And AI is one way that we can do that. And then I think other pieces that I'm certainly finding is that it's going to take cultural shifts in people. Yeah, that's encouraging to know that we're making some progress um like we said before like there's there's still lots of stuff that we need to do um so maybe at this point i'm thinking as you were talking there's a book that i read a long time ago called uh far from the tree by this guy named uh, andrew solomon who he got some kind of award for it and he talked about 40 different um kind of areas of disability uh the death was one for sure. Um, he talked about um, people who hadn't grown uh, all the way up to be like classified, you know, quote unquote, normal size. So like little people, um, population, folks with um, um, PTSD, talked about people with, um, you know, blindness. He talked about all of these different 40 categories and what we as a society needed to do to like learn about them and then empower them. Um, I'm curious if you had other like resources or things that you would recommend people check out. Um, so maybe we do like a little lightning round of, you mentioned the, the thing that the Obamas put out, but maybe we do like three books, you know, three documentaries and maybe some other things in order to just draw visibility to things that might uh, be useful as our community watches this video and wants to educate themselves. So maybe we start with, I don't know, books or you, you, you pick yeah. it, but give us a, a few resources. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the hardest thing for me is I'm a total bookworm. So, <laughs> uh, that's actually going to be hard, but I, I do like to recommend a newer resource that came out a couple months ago, disability visibility by mm -hmm. Alice Wong. Okay. And, um, it really, uh, is meant to start to have the conversation around uh, intersectionality uh, mm -hmm. with disability. And so uh, she also has a blog. So I would definitely look that up um, with a lot of voices uh, from marginalized communities that also have a disability. And so it's, I love people's stories. Yeah. Um, and so, because to me, those are things that you remember. And so I definitely recommend um, checking checking that one out um and in terms of i think what would be really interesting is there is a book by uh joseph hill he's a professor um at rit uh talking about just the history of black sign language mm -hmm. the reason why i like that one is because it was a lot of things that I knew about how the schools for the deaf and, and most of the time schools for the blind, they say segregated 
for a while really? after that was abolished by law. Hmm. And it has produced and still to this day, some serious inequities um, in our education of people with disabilities. And so that is also a driving force for me as to why education is so important. Because when we think about the education to employment pathway, um, if there are these inequities at the beginning of the pathway where students aren't even able to get on the trajectory yeah. Um, to get into a, a career like this, that is an issue. You know, you mentioned Gallaudet and RIT. Those are two um, of, the, of the schools with large uh, deaf populations in the country. There aren't many. So my parents didn't go to those schools. Yeah. <laughs> You know, what does that say for our livelihood? You know, because at the end of the day, people got to feed their families. That's, that's what we're talking about here. At the end of the day, people want to feed their families independently yeah. um, and, um, you know, that are able to do so. Uh, so lot, lots to check out with those two, but I think the audience will find those very fascinating. Yeah. And that's Joseph Hill, H-I-L-L or H-E-L-L? Yes, H-I-L-L. Yeah. And so you just learned a little bit about how Black, you know, sign language came to be because, um, and there's a, a clip of a, a Netflix uh, show, Strong Black Lead, where there's a, a African-American woman talking about Black sign language. She went viral on TikTok. And Black people were like, what? We had no idea, yeah. you know, that y'all had sauce on it just like we got Ebonics. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we do, you know, it, it's the way you, you do certain things um, to add extra flavor to it. Yeah, I for sure love us. And like wherever you <laughs> find black and brown people, you're going to find something creative and something saucy. <laughs> yes, yes. My dad was the best dancer in our family. Um, my The whole family used to talk about it. They would go and they were like, how how is he so good? I mean, and he loved the hip hop because he could feel the beat, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's just, um, this is us. And the reason why I, I recommend people just learn about it is because it's not always easy to talk about disability within the black community. Yep. Um, we shy away from it. And some of that is due to our history. Some of that is due to slavery. Um, there are lots of reasons, but in this day and age, particularly with this summer, uh, uh, you know, just the largest civil rights movement in our history due to the unrest, I think about people like my parents who, when you encounter a police officer, they're going to see that you're black first yep. before they see that you're deaf. So you won't, you might not even get to tell them, you know what I'm saying, that you have a disability. And so what do those encounters and interactions look like and how can they be made more equitable um, and then the flip side of that is that almost half of the black people that have been killed by police in this country um, have had a mental health disability, mm -hmm. but we're not allowed to talk about it. So it really is a very interesting intersection because, um, and you know, that's not what comes out in the story at all when yeah. it's reported. So you go to the black community and you have a disability and you go to the disability community and you're black. You know, yeah. where do you fit in? So would you say like, this is another probably uh, epiphany for folks that might watch this, um, the systemic kind of racism and inequality that normal um, people with, I mean, you don't need to look far or like crane your neck to see uh, kind of the disparity, but within the actual deaf community, uh, would you say that there's much nuance there or there is there a pretty like stark, um, is there a concept of like racism uh, within kind of the deaf community as well? Yeah, I would say that um, racism, you know, uh, Dr. Kendi said it best, so just a set of racist policies really you know let's stop making it seem like it's just this big boogeyman <laughs> it's these racist policies that are that are meant to oppress people and i have found it very interesting that they exist everywhere mm -hmm. because that's what it was designed to do they even exist in the in the disability you know community that is not exempt mm -hmm. um from racism and so hence it's so important for me 
to kick open this door for other uh, professionals of color with disabilities to come on in and to to have a seat. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fascinating. And hopefully, you know, people who are view. I know I'm learning so much for the first time just through through this conversation. Um, one to know about it, but then two to educate ourselves and be able to be an ally and an advocate like you're talking about is something that I think each of us should strive towards so that even if you don't have the words to say to your children or to the next generation, like what you are doing is speaking louder than what you're saying. So I'd like to encourage anybody who's like tuning into this. Um, if you don't have all the words, like uh, take all that good intention and like turn it into, into some action. Uh, that'll be, you know, necessary, appreciated, especially you know, <laughs> in the climate that we're in right now with the like last couple of weeks that we've had, uh, we gotta we gotta make some progress here. So um, and, and we need accomplices, right? <laughs> we yeah. need accomplices on all sides, black and brown with disabilities. That's that's where we're that's the point that we're at. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you very much. But now we need people to pull up as Rihanna said. Yeah. So let's um Let's continue with this little lightning round and maybe go into uh, just some fun facts about Heather. We've heard a whole bunch about like your upbringing and like uh, what you do for work. Um, how about, you know, are you a foodie? You like to watch sports? Like just give us a couple of fun facts and things that if you're not working and you're not focused on uh, heavy topics, what, what, what can we find you doing or what do you uh, like to get into? Yeah, that's a, a good one. Um, most people are surprised to know that I have three kids, uh, 10 and under, uh, and have been married for a good long time. So uh, my family is uh, very near and dear to my heart. And I'm so appreciative of um, how supportive they are in, in this fight. <laughs> um, for justice, because is we also have a, a term disability justice um, mm -hmm. in the disability community that incorporates kind of the, the race piece as well. Um, so you will find me learning from my kids because I am a life learn long learner. I am absolutely a reader. So you will find me with lots, multiple books, unfortunately, at the same time. Um, and I absolutely love learning through the eyes of my kids because that's empathy to me. Like I have forgotten how to play over the last year and they have taught me a lot because they're so young and there's no filter and there's no fear. Um, and so that it serves to make me even braver in, in stepping up and in, in speaking about about some of these challenges um, that people are often overlooked and mm -hmm. marginalized for. Do they also uh, sign? I would imagine like if you were to get on a, a, a video conference call with like their grandparents or something that uh, they might be able to do a little something, something these days. That's an interesting fact. <laughs> they don't sign as much. I guess for me, it was born out of necessity and uh, we live in another state and city. So unfortunately we don't see uh, family as well. And it's one of those things where it's really best that they're immersed in it. Mm -hmm. And so um, as grandparents, like my mom has put on like captioning during like their video chats. And um, so it's been really interesting to see the role technology is played in it. And I know you probably see this too. It's like our kids are just have different expectations. It's like, why can't you make that easy? Like mm -hmm. Amazon can get it in two days. I'm not going to wait. You know, everything is needs to be easier to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's go to like the mobile phone. I know that uh, it's been, geez, almost 12 or 13 years since like uh, the concept of an app store and like touchable, um, you know, phones that we've got. We were like, in, when we were in college, we were dreaming of like what exists like today. So tell me, um, give me a, a couple of your favorite uh, phone apps that you, I don't know, that you couldn't live without or that you you spend a whole lot of time on and that you appreciate. Maybe some obvious ones and then some gems that maybe people who are listening might not have heard of. 
Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I've, I've been in love with mobile phones since I was a teenager. I just knew that I was going to work on mobile phones. Um, and so I unfortunately am very tied to mine. <laughs> um, but um, I absolutely love my Google Keep and Apple Notes apps. Um, lots of to-dos uh, mm -hmm. because I have a, what do they call it? Multi-passionate. <laughs> I'm a multi-passionate person. Um, um, so that for sure. Um, and then other ones for sure are, I, I love the Abide Meditation app. Um, it just gets me right in the morning. It's brief enough and uh, works really well for where I am mm -hmm. in life, which is really you know, more so over the last year, just really been on a healing journey yeah. to kind of balance caring for myself as well as being an advocate because um, I really relate to so many people that were on the front lines this summer, you know, having to protest and do all this other stuff for, for a lot of us. And it's like, you go so hard every day, you know, but, you know, I had to learn how to, to do all of this at a more sustainable pace. And so um, healing books and that abide app and meditation is, is really where I'm at. Yeah, I would imagine that um, tiredness is something like if you've got three kids and you got these things that you're super passionate about and you're like beating the drum from nine to five and probably even outside of that every day that uh, rest and like self-care is something that uh, need to be a part of your life? Is this something that you've cultivated recently or something that would you characterize yourself as somebody who's always like been pretty aware and like when you need needed to take time, you've known how to do that? Or is it, are you like on a, on a path and a journey right now? No, I wish I could say that this was always my lifestyle, but um, a year ago, I really had to get on it. My body was just telling me things and I had been ignoring it for too long. I mean, the other part of this is we know tech culture is always on, always crazy deadlines. And so I think I thought that I was a person who would get to the rest part later, or I'm just going to do this and it never really ends. And so I had started to have some health challenges. Um, and so it just, fo it forced me to, to focus on me and to become a little bit more self-aware um, and to change a lot of habits. So that's, that's been a, the last year of just learning about healing um, on all fronts, all fronts. Uh, emotionally, physically, all of that in order to really uh, cultivate some important rituals for me, one of which is Sabbath, um, you know, my tribe and all of these other things that really fuel us for the fight. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm thinking about kids and I'm thinking about like how I, I laughed this morning. My son is doing some crazy. What was the last thing that made you laugh out loud, whether it's kid related or not? Oh my goodness. I like to say that I have three Disney actors in my house. Like I believe in them so much that I would drop this and go to California if my husband wasn't like, no. Um, and so the youngest is five and, and he is, he is just funny. I'll share one insightful and, and one funny um, thing. One insightful thing yesterday was I left my office and he's an office mate now. Um, and so he had, turned my blinds all the way up he had pulled them all the way up and so when I came back I was so puzzled and he was like well mommy you can't see the view in the sun with the blinds down like that and it totally changed my whole day because he was absolutely right but because I can get so focused on work and I and it's and it's a pandemic and I got all these things I'm doing I totally forgot that man, I can actually take a moment to look outside and, and see the sun and I happen to have a, a nice view um, here. So that that was certainly a blessing. Um, and then the funny thing is, <laughs> the funny thing is my husband had created a really nice date night uh, for us and he had uh, our kids, you know, be the waiter and the chef and kind of help us with water. And so at the end of them putting everything on the table, he was like, okay, thank you. That'll be all. And they were like, wait a minute, you owe us $10. <laughs> and they would not move. 
Oh man. And they were like, but mommy, you told me that you should get paid for work. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So they are very serious about, they compete with each other on, you know, their bank account balances and everything. Cause I, I am trying to teach them a legacy of wealth um, and entrepreneurship. Cause I do think that that's the, the next thing after all of this, but it was just so funny. It was just like, no, we're not leaving. We know you have the money and we did the work. <laughs> if only, right? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah, we, we need kids and like that element of levity, uh, hopefully on a daily basis for all of us, given the times we're in right now. So um, thank you for sharing for sharing that and making me laugh out loud right now. <laughs> um, how about if we go to, you know, we're, we're locked down right now, but like travel uh, has been a blessing that being in corporate America has afforded probably both of us. Um, we're not doing it so much, but like what are some of the places that uh, you might be looking to travel to once it opens back up or places that, you know, you'd like to share with our community that you've had, you know, pretty good times at uh, previous to, to right now. Ah, I love to travel. So probably just as much as food. I love, love, love to travel and I've been just really fortunate and blessed that I've been able to travel a lot during, um, during my career, uh, but on my, my bucket list is I would like to visit South Africa for lots of reasons. Um, I wanna see this diversity that they have. I wanna go back uh, to the motherland for sure, see the beaches. Um, I didn't know I could be a nature girl, being a, a core city, big city girl. Yeah. Uh, the Seattle area has turned me into nature, <laughs> um, a nature lover, but I kind of want to go back and, I mean, I kind of want to visit there and um, just learn about the people, learn a little bit more, uh, even about apartheid a little bit, because in this, during this summer, I don't know, like someone had mentioned to me how they, you know, were able to have their reconciliation trials um, and able to forgive. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, the process for, for truly reconciliation. And I'd love to, to see how that is panning out for them um, because we need something different in this country. Yeah, yeah, that's, I've had somebody else that I've done a conversation uh, like this with um, I believe it was Rhapsody, uh, the, the rapper and MC. She said that one of her first concerts that she did uh, out of the States was in South Africa. And to see kind of not just hundreds of people, which she was used to getting early in her career, uh, be out there like rocking and she's like doing her thing, but to have thousands of people and then most of them be like that look like you out there uh, vibing out to your music and the communal aspect of kind of the way they broke bread and did food together. And just like, um, just all of the questions about American culture uh, and some of the stereotypes that she was easily able to break, you know, just because those populations of people had never kind of come over to the States to know what it was really like. Um, so she spoke super highly of it. And that's something that's on my bucket list now. I mean, you said it, she said it, I, we gotta yeah. get it. <laughs> Seriously. Yep. So um, you mentioned food, uh, that you love food as much as you love travel. So let's maybe uh, take a couple minutes to talk about maybe a top two or top three dishes that you either like to chow down on or you like to prepare for the family. Uh, take us into your world of food. Well, as part of my healing journey, I've had to change my diet. So it's been really hard, but um, I still get down. I still like to host and I get down for my family and a good old pot of gumbo. Mm -hmm. Like it's something about gumbo. You got to get that Trinity and that root. Yeah. And, you know, of course, from scratch, like if it's not from scratch, we're, we're not talking. We yeah. aren't. Um, but to feed the soul, to feed your yeah. belly with some cornbread. So my gumbo is, is if I cook my gumbo, I love you because of the work <laughs> that it takes. But I love um, to touch people and, and to touch their, their belly. So gumbo for sure is kind of one of my favorite dishes um, to cook. And then in general, I'm a good, good steak and baked potato girl. I mean, Chicago has some great steak houses. So yeah. what can I say? 
you know it's it's made me very snobby <laughs> when I go other places you know it's like that meme that we had going around on social media where Chicago people to go to other places and be like is this your is this your downtown is this your restaurant yeah, yeah. like <laughs> So no offense if you're not from Chicago, but if you've been there for the food, then you kind of know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, so one, one thing that comes to mind also, I know you just got a couple minutes left before the top of the hour. Um, so as a person that appreciates hip hop and you mentioned Chicago, uh, I was so delighted a couple years to see a comment on like the Microsoft commercials. And maybe we just jump into like, what are a couple of uh, your favorite artists or, or things that you listen to to stay motivated or stay inspired as you're, you know, doing your work or maybe you're out, you know, doing your nature stuff in your neighborhood? Who are a couple of artists that you really like uh, listening to their music? Well, now you got me thinking about Common. Like, Common <laughs> and Will I Am are like on my go-to list of folks that I want to jo to join us on this journey for AI um, and education for students. So. It's on my list, um, but in terms of my favorite go-to artist, right now it really would be Tasha Cobbs Leonard. Like I gotta have that gospel, that soulful gospel for sure. And I love uh, Maverick City um, music. Uh, so those are, are things for me that just bring me and keep me grounded. Um, but in terms of, of hip hop, definitely comment. I mean, can you really be from Chicago if you don't like comment? <laughs> uh yeah common um and lecrae gotcha gotcha um well i like to say um how honored and inspiring this has been for me um so I, well, first i want to thank you like on behalf of our community for your time and for um just the important conversation i think you raise a lot of things that are probably net new for people that they uh, didn't know about previously and in doing that like we've accomplished our goal of like um, you know, creating a safe space for people to learn about new things, to check out resources, and to hopefully be able to put these things in their back pockets so that they can get um, from where they are to where they're trying to go faster uh, than the previous generation. So, uh, one, thank you. Uh, and then, two, if you have a couple of, you know, we talked about lots of different things in the conversation, but maybe uh just a couple of points that you would say if you didn't get anything else besides these couple of things out of the conversation um whether they be inspirations or things to consider uh, i'll leave you with the last word to be able to just give out to the people yeah i appreciate this so much um it's always great to share and um to provide aha moments for folks where this might not even be on their radar but i will will leave with just some um, core messages, which is that really um, it's important to be inclusive and that includes people with disabilities. And the best way to know how to be an ally um, and an accomplice is to immerse yourself uh, around other people with disabilities to, to learn what the needs are. And I promise you that that will inspire you in innovation for sure. And then the second thing is that um, mental health mm -hmm. is important and it's the number one growing disability in the world and it's something that maybe touches us a lot more than we think perhaps looking at a person with a, a physical disability does and so you're closer to, to uh, encountering people with disabilities than you think and so it's definitely time to figure out what you can do to help empower somebody else. And so it's totally great to get all of this learning, but if we don't do anything with it to empower other people, then what's, what's the point? Yeah. And man, I like what you said earlier about like, you know, you might not be in one now, but you might be headed to one in your future. So it behooves all of us to uh, get that education now to understand what the implications uh, of the tech that we talked about and a bunch of other factors are and to treat each other, each other with kindness and with empathy and um, just create the world and the equitable futures that we want, uh, not just for ourselves, but for the next generation as well. So 
Uh, I think that's a good place to leave it. Um, have a great, great rest of the week and weekend. And um, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here um, at In the Green Room, another episode uh, in the book. So, so Heather, we thank you so much. And if there's ever any stuff that our community could do for you, um, don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. You're family now. And uh, <laughs> we look forward to, uh, to seeing you shine continually as you uh, go through your journey uh, in tech in AI, in accessibility. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye.